Was anyone really blessed by that sermon last week? Yeah. We were talking about that as a staff. Like, I feel like God was doing something and, and, and speaking to some people here. It's not every single person, and that's okay. We don't expect that God would speak to me every single time, but he's speaking to us as a corporate community. And different ones of us, we attach ourselves to, word, to words as the word of God is proclaimed. And particularly where I was sitting, I was sitting in front of Kwai and Tommy, and it felt like a bit of an amen corner. So I'm thinking, you too, were you too blessed by last? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I think I, I felt even more encouraged in my spirit. I, I don't always get to sit through an entire message from the mix of both, you know, the work job of like sometimes lunch orders and different things, but also, of course, having a baby. And so last Sunday, just being able to sit through the entire sermon, I think, helped pave the way for me to be able to receive. But hearing the Word of God, hearing uh, Tommy and Quilin and Unison as a, as, a, <laughs> as a friendship group there, hearing particularly the, the word that stood out to me, and I wrote this in the email, was that you are made to endure. That was the word for me in that sermon. And so some of you, I think, did connect to that one. And, you know, Jesus recognizes this church of Philadelphia as she shared, which is where we get this name, as one that had little strength, but you have kept my word. And they have kept his command to patiently endure. Though the earthquakes come in our lives as they will inevitably come, the Lord has an open door over me. He has an open door over you. And the truth, you know it's good gospel truth when it hurts a little bit. You know, it says it's a sword, and a sword does what it's supposed to do. It cuts a little bit. You were made to endure. It's like there's refreshment even though it hurts a little bit. And I think that's what some of us were feeling in the room last Sunday. It, as Scripture says, it divides soul and spirit joint and marrow. And as she talked about, I can very much relate to the idea that I would think I would prefer the open door without the earthquake, right? I'm about the open door on a beach. I'm about the open door in paradise. You know, YWAM has a base in Kona. That's, that's my calling. <laughs> the open door with the white picket fence. I try to mix the American dream or the prosperity gospel with the, with the gospel itself, but I find that that doesn't have that sword, it hurts, but it feels good truth there. Jesus reminds his friends over and over in Scripture that you should expect, even look forward to, in a sense, the tribulation that is coming. It doesn't mean we're, we're masochists, that we want to just stay in the midst of the pain, but we know that the sword, even though it hurts, it feels good, too. You are made to endure. I, I think it was one of you that said, like, what doesn't kill you, make you makes you stronger, that cliche. And then I added to that, and I thought to myself, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, but even if it kills you, you're going to heaven. <laughs> so, man, you can use that if you want. <laughs> Either way, it's a win-win, right? To... To live is Christ, to die is gain, says Paul. In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So this week I was pondering, obviously, on this word, getting encouraged even as I speak this here before you. And when I look for an example of one who endures well, who proves that we are, in fact, as Pastor Susie said, and more importantly, the Bible says, made to endure, I can't help but think of Joseph. Of course, I'm thinking of him as well, because week after week, we're putting together materials, and in house church, he's the character we're going, on, going over. But to me, he captures this idea that you were made to endure, gives us a model to look to. And we see the open door of God's will over Joseph's life, right? How he uses him for the nation of Israel, for the re redemption story of him and his family, this remarkable story and continued test of character. And we're going to turn in a minute to Genesis chapter 40, in which we see such an open door in the midst of earthquakes. So if you can, you can open up if you want. And a chapter before we're going to be for today, Gen Genesis chapter 40, a chapter before, in Genesis 39, there's this phrase that's used four times 
in the Bible are four times, particularly in this chapter, and it's this. The Lord was with Joseph. I believe that being able to endure well is about recognizing that the Lord is with you. And not only that, the reality that you are not, just as you're not made to, just as you're made to endure, recognizing that you are not to endure it alone. You are made to endure, but only because the Lord is with you, not because you're particularly strong, not because you have this personality to be able to just handle. Some people can handle pain. You know, they go to the doctor and they get, uh, they get like stitches or they, they get a chusa, what does that call in English? <laughs> Shots, injections. <laughs> it's because I'm tired, not because my Korean is so good. And because I go to get chusa with Geraldine very often for vaccinations and stuff. So it's on the tip of my tongue. Some people can naturally handle that kind of pain that comes with injections. And, but it's not just that. It's recognizing that you're not alone in the journey. That's how you can endure. And so I love that phrase, the Lord was with Joseph. Now, if I were to pray over you guys or someone was to pray over you and you were to hear a word over yourself, you, Deborah, are a Joseph, you would immediately probably get excited and think, all right, influence, authority, privilege, and sure enough, that's part of Joseph's life. You know, if, if you were to hear from the pulpit, 2024, Joseph's arise, it's like, come on, I'm one of those Josephs. We like that kind of word. And again, certainly Joseph fit the bill here. He had the signet ring, which gave him the full power and authority of Egypt. He could write all the checks, had, was second only to Pharaoh in power, and God used him to save the nations from starvation we would say yes to that word, I'm a Joseph, I knew it. My promotion's coming, my boss is finally going to give me the job I knew that I deserved all along. She's going to give me more money. I'm going to finally receive that, that recognition. And Joseph undoubtedly received these blessings. But, of course, the story with Joseph is there was also tremendous pain in the midst of God being with him. You know how many years Joseph was in prison for? You want to take a guess? Yeah, very good. Between 10 and 14, 13 years, 13 years he was in prison. From age 17 to 30, rotting in prison. And, and then you could add up and say it's a total of 22 years between when he was sent in prison to when the reconciliation with his family ultimately came. Around age 39. So you're a Joseph. Receive that word, right? So what if the prophetic word over you really is, you're going to be a Joseph, you might be betrayed by your family, you're going to be a slave for how many years? 13 years, you will be falsely accused, but be of good cheer because the Lord is with you. You are a favored one. You're made to endure. The earthquakes are going to come, but you're Philadelphia. So being a Joseph then obviously is not just about the elevation, though it's part of it, but there's suffering in the journey of the Lord being with you as well. And yet the overarching truth in the midst of his entire life was no matter what, I know that God is with me, and I'm blessed by that truth. Through the years not only of promotion, but also the years of pain, betrayal, enduring through it all, and in every season, he desires to display that he is with me for others to see that. Not only when I have the provision, the friends, and the comfort, but when all is stripped away, he still wants to show me off as a tool that this one has God with him. Yay! I literally wrote, yay! <laughs> so with that, <clears throat> let's look at Genesis chapter 40 together where we're going to see the fruits of God's faithful presence with Joseph and what a life of being a church of Philadelphia, what a life of enduring well may indeed look like. So I'll read all of Genesis 40 here. 
reading from the ESV. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against the Lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both dreamed, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison. Each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, we've had dreams and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, in my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews, And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Amen. So the first verse, it begins with this, some time after this. I hope as active readers, you won't just keep reading. You're going to say, what's the this that it's referring to? Or said another way, some preachers will say, if you see a therefore, sorry, my accent sounded funny. If you see (laughs) people from the South, (laughs) if you see a therefore, do you know how it goes? Ask why it's, or what it's, Therefore, okay? If you see a therefore, what is it there for? And the idea is when you see a a device like that, you don't want to just jump too quickly. The narrator is referring to something. And so sometime after this, as this text begins, what is this referring to? Basically, Joseph's been prisoned for a little while up to this point, okay? And he's been having favor with the prison guard, which is a common element. Wherever Joseph is placed, he's experiencing favor. He had favor with his dad. He receives this amazing coat, and then his brothers hate him for it. He receives uh, favor in Potiphar's house. He does amazing in his job, and so Potiphar loves him until he's, uh, then his wife accuses him of adultery, sent to prison, and now he has favor again with the, with the guard of the prison, and basically he, he ends up being able to manage and steward the s- prisoners that are under him. So he, he, whatever situation he, in, he is in, he always rises to a place of, of authority and blessing, even though there's tremendous suffering along the way of that 13 years of being in prison, of course, being misunderstood, being wrongly accused. And so at, then at this point, when this text begins, the cupbearer and the baker are these two characters, and you probably are familiar with the story, they're in charge of, they have particular jobs that are the reason that Pharaoh is offended at them. 
Okay, the, the baker is, as you would expect, he makes the food, he makes the bread, he ba bakes the bread. The cupbearer is like the modern equivalent of a secret service agent. They're the last line of defense to protect the king against something happening. So the, be, mainly being poisoned, right? You know, the, the food or the drink that's coming into the body, they're the ones that actually taste test it and say, this is safe and, and give it to, to, to king, give it to the pharaoh. And so if you can't trust your cupbearer, you're, you're, you're dead, right? And then it says that they're offended, or Pharaoh is offended at these two, and they end up in prison. And so probably what happened was Pharaoh found, found out that there was an assassination attempt. And who are the ones to blame if food was going to be poisoned, if drink was going to be poisoned? Who's making the food in the kitchen? and who's taste-testing the food to make it safe. So that's probably the context in which these two are thrown in prison. And so these two men lost everything, and they were in a constant state of fear for their lives. They lost their jobs, and they could end up uh, dying, because when you have Pharaoh angry at you for probably trying to assassinate him, it's not going to go over well for you. So just as Joseph had, these two men lost everything, and God chose in his divine sovereignty to bring these two under Joseph's care. So that's the truth for us, is that as those who carry God's presence with us, as those who are blessed by the Lord, though we may go through periods of suffering and betrayal, it may not look like that white picket fence, it may not be Philadelphia in Hawaii, it may be a place of earthquakes, that God being with you means that he divinely will bring people, oftentimes at the lowest place of their life, to you for you to be able to minister to them, which is what God does here with the baker and the, and the cupbearer. And ironically, again, this is not just the lowest place of the baker and the cupbearer's life, it was also the lowest place in Joseph's life. And yet, he said, even in that state, or maybe even especially in that state, I want you to minister to these next to you. When we're weak, when we're beaten down ourselves, he likely still has plans for you to encourage one another. It's not like, get, 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 get ready to go back to the team, and then I'm going to use you to bless someone else. Maybe when you're in your darkest state, your most difficult state, and I think, you know, we, we just heard from David, and he could have testified to this. When he was going through the suffering in his body, God was still using you, weren't you, to bring encouragement and blessing to other people, to pray for them, to speak life to them. And that's, that's the truth of the gospel that we experience so often, is that when we ourselves are tired, we're hurt, we're discouraged, maybe there's someone next to you that he wants to use you to encourage in that moment. God brought the cupbearer and the the baker, to Joseph, to Joseph to be encouraged by God. So Joseph was used as an ambassador to those whom God brought before him, often as a comforter. And the Bible says that he desires that we would comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have received. Doesn't mean that the paycheck is coming in, doesn't mean our life is easy, but as believers in Christ, there is a comfort that even in those seasons we can share with one another. 2 Corinthians 1 says, The Father of compassion and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our trouble, so we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Joseph was a comforter acting on behalf of God. He was an ambassador bringing the comfort to these two men. And so that's my sermon title for today, is Joseph was a comforter in the pain. And the question becomes, it's kind of ambiguous on, pers on purpose, whose pain? Both the cupbearer and the baker and Joseph. In your own pain, he will use you to be a blessing to someone else in the midst of their pain. Joseph was a comforter in the midst of his own pain and their pain. And there's three aspects I want us to see today from our text in ch chapter 40 in the way in which God used Joseph to bring comfort to these two men. Verse 4, 
It says, the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he, int- he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. Other translation says, he took care of them, he looked after them, he served them, he waited on them. I believe that the first step as a Christian is to regularly serve others around us. Even when we ourselves are going through difficulty and pain, their Christian is always called to be about the life of service. We use our given authority that we receive, even when it's in the midst of a prison. It's not the authority of being in Pharaoh's house. It's the authority of being a lowly prisoner, and yet he still had authority. He used it to be able to serve others. He ministered to them, and he brought them what they needed. And it also is not just once or twice or for a week. It's regularly committing to their needs day in and day out. I love that it says, continued for some time in custody. So Joseph was every day taking this seriously of taking care of their needs. You know, those who are our parents understand that you can't just choose to take a day off because you're sick, because you're not feeling like it, because I'm not in the mood. I mean, thank God that there's two parents, and then there's friends that we have, like Luna, that we can give, you know, our daughter to, to Luna to hold her when we need it. But you, overall, you can't just take, you know, I'm going to take three days off. I'm just going to take a vacation. Parents are taught by God that this is a full-time commitment. This is a day-in and day-out thing. And I've often heard with ministry with orphans particularly that they look to see who sticks around. Anybody can just show up once or twice, and I don't want to downplay the importance of volunteer work. I love the fact that, you know, we do like on Christmas, we minister to the orphans. But the real change happens in the day in and day out. When I feel like it, when I don't feel like it, when I'm, when I'm excited, when I'm not as excited, but it's like I'm going to commit to serve you day in and day out. And we see this kind of regularly, intentionally, that Joseph was showing up and caring for their needs. People around you who God brings into your sphere will also be looking to see if you will show up for them regularly. Not just when, you, when it's convenient, not just when you're having a good day, but are you committed to be like a family member and say, I'm here with you? And it may be for a season. I believe relationships can be for a season. It's not that you are committed, you know, for an entire lifetime to every relationship. But I think that there is something to say, you know, I feel like God is highlighting this divine relationship and I want to be here for you through day in and day out. Joseph modeled that. He was committed and didn't back down. Number two, Joseph comforted them by observing them. Verse 6 says this, When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. How does Joseph even recognize that they're sad? I mean, at one level, this doesn't really feel like an observation or a prophetic word. It's like, we're all in prison. Hey, are you having a hard day? (laughs) You would think it would be, you know, kind of a hard situation every day. It doesn't take a uh, a lot of genius to understand that. And yet, here, obviously, it was something different than normal. Joseph was attuned even in the midst of his own suffering and difficulty, that, hey, something is different about the cupbearer and the baker today. Comes to breakfast. They're about to have breakfast. I don't know what the, what the prison breakfast was like, but I imagine it wasn't, you know, wasn't a fancy kogi or something. But they're having, their, they're having their, their prison breakfast, and he looks at the two of them, and he says, hey, something's different today. He recognized. He observed Joseph, we would expect as he's suffering in prison that he would be so self-consumed with grief that he would be unable to see someone else's pain. But he recognized that something was different. If you're caught in self-pity, if you're caught in bitterness, it's very hard to be aware of the concerns of others. Or even if you're just selfish, because that's how we're born, we're born into sin, it can be hard to be aware of that. I remember when Amy and I first started dating, it was a really hot summer day, and I, we'd get into the car, you know, sweat dripping down our face, get into the car, 
turn on the AC, all excited to get that AC, and without thinking, I moved all the vents, angled to myself. <laughs> She's like looking at me, are you kidding me? There was no ill intention. I just, you know, I'm born as a selfish person, and I'm learning that journey of being aware and thinking about somebody else. But in that morning, you know, in that day of, of being hot in the, in the car, I wouldn't have noticed if she was having a hard day. I didn't even notice that swept, sweat was dripping down her head. And so I think like many of us, we, we tend to think about our needs, we fulfill our needs, and then we maybe we'll consider, you know, somebody else. Even a loved one, we often will just focus on ourselves first. And yet, Joseph, in the midst of his suffering, moved the air vent to the butler and the, to the, to the baker and the, the cupbearer. It would be easy to think, again, because of the way he suffered, that everything would center on his feelings and hurts. He got the wrong end of the stick. You know, I was upright, then I landed in prison. We could understand, we could even see that he would justify drawing back. Even when I tr- try to do the right thing, God, it never works out. I get a dream, I believe it's from you, I share it excitedly with my brothers, I end up in prison. I walk holy and righteous, even though Potiphar's wife is beautiful and all these things, I'm like, no, I'm not going to sin against God. But I just keep ending up in the midst of this suffering, I'm going to draw back and just think about myself. We could understand if he ended with that perspective. But instead, Joseph chose to care for those around him. He not only served their external needs day in and day out consistently, but he was keenly sensitive to the internal world of those around him as well, of those whose care he had been entrusted with. God showed him that being aware of others' emotional states around us actually has everything to do with his calling. And it has everything to do with our calling, being aware of other states around us as well. And then it goes one step forward, one step further. What does Joseph do with the observation? You know, it it, it would mean something if you're like, hey, I feel like you're having a, you know, a hard day. John is, you know, I feel like you're having a hard day. But if it ended there, it would kind of feel like, hey, (laughs) I need some help. Can you, is that it? You're just going to recognize that I'm having ever had someone that just said, hey, it looks like you're, you're having a hard time. It looks like you're tired, but it doesn't really feel like, you know, maybe the empathy there is there or what have you. It, it, it cuts short. But he takes it a step f- further. Christian life has to be about action, and he comforts them by pursuing them. After recognizing not just the external needs, not just the internal, wow, something's off with you, but you actually have to turn that air vent to the person. Wow, Amy, it looks like you're you're hot. It looks like you're suffering. Why don't you open up the window while I turn on the AC towards myself? No, you want to turn the air vent to the other. Joseph comforts them by pursuing these two, and then he asks them, he says, hey, verse 7 and 8, why are your faces downcast today? Then they tell, it's because we had these dreams, we had these fearful dreams. And then he responds by saying, please, tell them to me. I love the addition of please. We can't force anyone to invite them into our life. You can't force access. Even you get a job as being a pastor, you don't have an entitlement to hear everybody's story and hurt. It's an invitation. We can say, please, I believe that God's love pursues us, and he asks us and says, I think is something okay, something seems off. Please share it with me. I want to be in this journey with you. But he doesn't force it. He invites it. Please tell me the dream. And it's not because he has a solution either. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys in marriage particularly get into trouble because they try to fix everything. You know, the, the wife will tell about the pain they're going through, and it's like, I'm the fixer-upper. All you got to do is tell this person this, do this, and it's done. And then your wife is still upset, and you're like, what's wrong? Isn't that like a good solution? We want to just give the solution right away. But I love that first it's about listening, and second of all, Joseph doesn't pretend that he has a solution. He says, why don't you tell me the dream God is in the interpretation business. 
I am not the one who can solve your problem, but let's invite God into this journey together. I'm going to cry with you. I'm going to contend with you. If I can help with your physical needs, the external serving, I'll do that. You need money. Like, how can I support you? But at the end of the day, Joseph did not think that he was the solution to the baker and the butler. He understood that it was God's business to, the, to do the interpretation of the dream. If you're going to be a fixer-upper, only let God be the fixer-upper. Don't let don't just try to do it of your own strength. He's earnest, and yet he's so polite. He says, please. God's servants never force another to share, but they do pursue you. They pursue you intentionally. There's this missionary. Her name is Heidi Baker. Has anyone heard of Heidi Baker here? Yeah. Missionary to Mozambique. Works with uh, thousands and thousands of orphans and also part of a church planting movement. There's 5,000 churches, I guess, in Mozambique, and there's even thousands more outside. 8,000 churches is what I read recently. They do Bible schools, medical clinics, church-based orphan care, well drilling, schools, et cetera, et cetera. They see a lot of physical healing. And I love this very simple phrase, she says, love looks like something. Love looks like tangibly serving Love looks like being aware of the difficulty and the struggle of your neighbor next to you. Remember, we're, we all may go through earthquakes. It may hit us at different seasons. We're not all in the earthquake season together. But there's earthquakes that, ha- that can happen side by side. And love looks like intentionally pursuing and inviting God into the journey with you. Love looks tangible. Love looks like something. And the Bible says, faith without works is dead. That's basically that same idea. Are we practically pursuing the neighbor around us? And so I have a couple of questions I want us to ask to consider in our own journey. Three questions. Number one, have you ever gone through something and someone was unexpectedly there for you right when you most needed it? You experienced a God sent Joseph at just the right time in your life. The truth is God calls us to be a Joseph, but he also raises up Joseph to be there for you when you're the cupbearer, when you're the baker, when you also need that word in that season. Have you experienced that? And again, it can be small and yet very significant. I remember when I got COVID and Stella, I don't know if Stella, Stella's not here, right? Stella is, was, uh, found out that I had COVID and sent me a cacao gift. She sent me basically like a get well package uh, for, you know, for sickness. And I forget all these like high vitamin type of, you know, kind of stuff that your Korean mom will send you, you know. She sent it to me and it was so, it felt so out of the blue and it ministered to my heart so much that somebody was thinking about me. You know, that feeling when you're sick and you're by yourself and it's like, who cares? Well, people do care, but sometimes you have those kind of feelings. I'm just suffering by myself. And just at that moment, her cocktail message gave me such life. Maybe you've experienced that kind of thing, whether it's physical sickness, whether it's spiritual sickness, but it's just at the right moment you get that God sent Joseph to you. Question number two. Is there someone that you've known that's gone through a hard time, and you were able to be there for them, where you experienced the joy of being a Joseph to him or her in that moment. And again, it may have been when you yourself were suffering and in a difficult season. There was this friend of mine, his name is Bryce. He's with, he's with the Lord now. And I met him when I was in Kansas City. He... He was uh, just like such a bright, vibrant soul for God. Uh, and he had, a, um, he had a stroke in his early 20s, and it left him una- unable to speak very well, and he loved music, he loved dancing, and he would, he would still worship the Lord in the best way that he physically could. He would go up to the front of the lines uh, in worship, and he would, you know, dance, you know, kind of slowly and stuff as he was able to. And sometimes it was difficult to understand him. But I remember in the church services, often seeing such com- what I would call compassion for him when there was you know, opportunities to pray for people for healing. Or he would, he, would, he would raise his hand all the time that God would heal him of the effects of the stroke. 
And, he, and, and people would come around him and give him these huge, you know, hugs and say, you know, I love you, Bryce. You're awesome. And, and I ended up uh, going up to him, and I said, hey, I want to get to know you more. Can, can, we, can we hang out? I, I felt like the, the, the eagerness of the Lord give it to me to say, like, I want to I spend time and become his friend, get to know him. And we hung out a couple of times. We would get meals together. I would ask him about his journey in God. He would encourage me with his, his faith. He was so optimistic. Like Joseph, I never heard him complain, and yet he couldn't do the things that, you know, we all take for granted. He had spit come out of his mouth. I mean, it was, it was a hard journey that he had, and yet he was so vibrant for the Lord. It wasn't just like I was ministering to him. He was ministering to me. It was back and forth, just amazing uh, time of fellowship in just a few times, and Sometimes there were practical needs. He would ask me for a ride because he can't drive, and he had, a, he had someone come to his house like once a week and help him kind of clean up and do these things. But he would need rides, and I said, oh, I'd love to drive you. I remember I picked him up one time, maybe our third or fourth t- time hanging out, and he's like, why are you doing this? And I just, and I just said, like, I, uh, I feel the love of God for you. I, I enjoy being together with you. And he just he couldn't quite understand it. Like, why are you doing this? And we would, uh, yeah, we, we hung out maybe like five or six times. Uh, bought him a couple of gifts here and there, like a book in the bookstores, different things. Our relationship grew. And I honestly didn't do as much as I wish I would have for him. Uh, Amy said to me one time, she's, you know, full of compassion and mercy. She's like, we should go clean his house for him. And I, I didn't say no, but I, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't say yes immediately. I didn't act on, the, on the God's blessing immediately. And I wish I would have, you know, so like I'm nowhere near the hero of the story. I don't want you to hear that in the slightest. But at his funeral, he, he, then, he then passed away, and I was, you know, quite surprised by that and, and, and super sad. And I go to the funeral, and I ended up sharing some things, and I broke down in tears, and I felt like God told me I have an intercessor in heaven who's encouraging me in this faith. But you know what his mom said to me? I hung out with him maybe five, six times total. He said, you are his best friend five or six times. And I felt the conviction of the Lord because, like, I could have done more. I could have cleaned his house, all this stuff. But I also felt the conviction of the church, to be honest, that in a time of worship, it's like, I love you, Bryce. You're awesome, Bryce. It seems like everyone is, like, there for him. And yet, when he needed a ride, when he needed these tangible things, who was there for him? He couldn't even receive at first that I just wanted to be his friend because he's like, is there some kind of agenda here? Why are you doing this? The only other person that took care of him outside of his mom is someone who's paid to do that and did probably like the bare minimum. I mean, his house was like really, really, you know, messy and he, he just had like these like, you know, really unhealthy meals all the time that, that you microwave, you know, microwave meals. And I just felt like the heaviness that where are the Josephs that are going to be ministering, you know, to, to somebody like this? And it's not just, again, one way. It's also receiving, that I was the baker and I was the, um, the cupbearer in that scene as well, that he encouraged me so much in my faith, and I believe it. I have an intercessor in heaven today. But the question is, you know, is there someone who's going through a hard time that maybe God would invite you to be there for them? Remember another friend of ours, she she ended up getting married, and we didn't really know the guy, and ended up just being a disaster, you know, getting married, and turns out he's not the one, not the kind of guy she thought he was, and not even sure he's a, be- probably not a believer based on, even though it sounded like he was at first, just treated her terribly, abuse kind of situation, and she came back to Kansas City in the most shame imaginable, like, I was so excited, of, I'm going to be married, and it was like everyone's sending her off in this blessing, and then she comes back, and she's like, I don't know who to reach out to. And she called Amy. And, and Amy, as she would always do, she, you know, takes her under a wing and, like, takes her shopping and has her stay at her house and does all these things. And we were talking about it later. Like, what a blessing to have people that will, will want to reach out. And they don't know who to reach out to, and they'll reach out to you. And so I'm grateful for Amy that she pushes me to grow in this area. And... Uh, I pray that we could experience that gift of not just receiving the Josephs in our life in that season of need, but also being used by the Lord in that season as well. Because that is the gospel. And number three, are you going through something right now today where you need help? Joseph also needed help. 
where you're trying to walk through it alone right now, or perhaps you feel like you're left to walk through it alone. I remember when Jesse came up here and she was inviting people to join the hospitality team, and there so far haven't been a lot of people that responded, so that's still an ongoing invitation. She said something to the fact of, like, you can come to church where we have, you know, 70, 80 people here, and yet you can still feel alone, that you can still go home lonely. And that's a truth of a broken world, but it's not a truth that we can say that's the reality of life. It's not. The kingdom is about uh, not being alone in the midst of your, of your journey, not being alone in the midst of your burdens. And so do you have a place where you can ask for help? That's the context of our house churches as you're walking together in a season for an extended period of time. There's consistency. I hope that there's a place of vulnerability. I encourage you, open up if you haven't before. Maybe it's your whole house church. Maybe it's one person. Say, I want to share this. I'm going through this journey, and I don't want to do it alone. As Panita shared, we also have the invitation of sharing your prayer requests. Let us know as a staff. We'll keep them confidential. It's with Pastor Susie and Gina and I that we can pray every Friday. We contend for these prayer requests that come in. But I implore you, do not continue to walk this journey alone. You're meant to endure. The earthquakes will come, but you're not meant to do it by yourself. Being cared and caring for others is the journey of Christianity. There's 59 one another statements in the New Testament. How you treat one another, love one another, be at peace with one another. 59 in the New Testament. Again, you're meant to endure, but it's in the context of community. God's presence with you shows up through one another. You to a brother and sister and them to you couple of clarifying points to mention about this text is, number one, comforting another as Joseph comforted the cupbearer and the baker does not mean it's always sharing what the other person wants to hear. The cupbearer was obviously thrilled to hear his story that he's going to be released, he's going to serve the Pharaoh again. Yes, my dream is going to come true and I only have to wait three days for it. And so what happens is the baker is equally excited. Tell me mine. Tell me mine. Have you ever heard, like, heard someone that received like, a really prof- powerful prophetic word, and you're like, God, come to me. God, come to me. And maybe you don't get any, you get overlooked entirely, or it's like, God loves you. You know, someone got this really long, elaborate prophetic word, and God loves you. And that's the greatest truth we could ever receive, but what about mine? And this guy receives a word that's really hard to stomach. You're going to die. <laughs> he's going he's gonna to get back to his job. You, on the other hand, are going to die in three, three, three days. So I hope you haven't received a prophetic word like that. Throw it away in this, <laughs> the new covenant Christianity. It could happen with Ananias and Sapphira, but in general, don't, don't hold that word. But Joseph was faithful to share both words. When we have access to another as God's servants, we are always to be in compassion and always in love, but we're to be faithful messengers at the same time. We must share the truth of Christ, not giving in to the spirit of compromise in this age. If one is going astray, we're to lead a life of not allowing the word of God to be compromised. And so there's a tone, there's a way to do it. But if someone asks you, you know, is it okay that I, you know, continue in this sexual relationship outside of marriage, I hope that you're saying no. I hope that we're speaking life, that this, these kind of sins, that living this way will lead a life of destruction. There's both, love is about, is about the truth either way that it comes. And number two, notice how even though Joseph asked for the cupbearer to remember him, because he wants to get out of prison, Remember, we're not sadomasochists. We don't long to stay in the suffering. If you're sick, I hope you don't say, God, extend my sickness. God will work through that, through that season. You'll experience the favor of God, the blessing of God through that season. But we don't desire to prolong that. Actually, getting out is a good thing. It's just don't waste that season that you do have in the midst of the suffering. Don't miss the brother and sister next to you in the midst of that suffering. And so Joseph does, and I believe rightly, asks for the, the cupbearer to remember him. You're going to get out in three days. Remember, like I told you, remember me and help me to get out. But 
it ends in a very ominous note, and of course, we have the blessing where we know the, how the story continues, but imagine if you, it was the first time hearing this text, and it says, you, you don't get to 41 till next week, and it says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Suffering in prison, I guess this would be the 11th year, because he's in prison for 13 years, and it's like, please remember me, Please help me to get out. This is finally our moment. God raised up these perfect scenario. Please remember me. And then it says he forgot him. How many years passed then? Two years. And that's how chapter 40 begins. Two years had, or chapter 41 begins with after two whole years, then Pharaoh dreams and the story uh, picks up again. And so my point that I want you to hear is this. Even though we can desire to be out of a season of suffering, The reality is that serving others cannot be motivated first by the results or of the or the other person receiving it, lest it become manipulation. Meaning Joseph didn't interpret the dream just so that he could get out. He interpreted the dream because of the compassion of Christ that was upon him, because he cared to see those around him were in this place of hurting and suffering, and he would do whatever he could to help them. If you can get out afterwards, that's a plus. And it's not bad to ask for those things. Ask for, you know, for for that season of breakthrough to finally come. Pray for those things. But it wasn't to be able to have that effect, first and foremost. It can't be based on appreciation that we do acts of service. It can't be based that I get that promotion. It can't be based on even you recognizing how great of a person I am. Sometimes we do it out of the wrong spirit to be able to feel validated. I'm going to serve on this team so that I can finally get recognition. There is a day of recognition coming, coming, but it's the day when you enter into God's presence and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's not downplay the importance of honoring and recognizing people in this, in this age, but that can't be the motivation for us to act as Joseph did that we're just going to help someone endure so that I can get out of my situation, so that I can finally receive that recognition and that longing I've, I've searched for. I remember Pastor Susie shared how even though G- Jesus knew Judas would betray him, he still chose to serve him abundantly, to serve his friend with love. He washed his very betrayer's feet. Jesus could have said, if anybody didn't deserve that, I'm not going to give it to Judas, but he doesn't hold back for anybody. The Spirit of God does not hold back love. It's not based on the result that you receive. We can't be in this journey of love for what I'm going to get out of it. Are we serving in church for the well done? Are we hosting so that we hear other people say thank you? It does mean a lot. You know, you host and you put all this effort in. People say thank you. Do that. But that that cannot be the motivation to feel your sense of belonging, to I finally have my place. It's so that I can display the love of Christ to this person, whether or not they can ever repay me. Are we doing it because of the presence of God that follows us, gives me strength to pour my life out regardless of the response? C.S. Lewis, he wrote a book called The Four Loves. We we know C.S. Lewis from Narnia, but he wrote other books beyond Narnia. One of them is called The Four Loves. I learned about this in seminary. And there's these two loves that are particularly uh, highlighted that stood out to me. One is called need love, need love. The other is called gift love. And need love is something that displays dependence and necessity upon another entity, as he says. So basically... I'm going to serve you so that I get this need of mine fulfilled. But the gospel is about something called gift love. It's a love that is given, provided freely, unconditionally, unwearied, and without any expectation of return. That is the love of Jesus that I believe we see displayed through Joseph. Joseph would not have done anything differently had he known that the that the cupbearer would forget him? What if the story ends that Joseph died in prison? What if the aftermath of the story never happened? Would the Spirit of God say it wasn't worth giving this faithful word to, to the two of them? I believe Joseph would have done it anyway because of the compassion of God that he experienced. So 
So in conclusion, I'll invite the worship team up. I believe that our greater Joseph, Jesus himself, he comes to us and he also asks us if we're okay. Is something, is something wrong? Are you okay? He offers himself to us and he wants to hear. I love the, the story, the road to Emmaus that Pastor Susie recently, recently shared in her Easter message. In Luke chapter 24, you have these two disciples. They're walking down the road. They're disillusioned. Everything that they thought would happen about the messianic expectation, and we finally found the one we were looking for, and yet it ended with his death, and they're like, what do we do now? They're walking home in this journey of, this long journey home. And Jesus shows up in the midst of the two of them. He said, what are you guys talking about? I want to be in the conversation with you. I want to hear what's, what's hurting you. I don't want to just deal with only your external needs, though I'm so grateful that God does deal with our external needs. He is looking to the state of our heart. He recognizes times when our heart is not okay. And he comes and asks us, what's wrong? What are you guys talking about? What's the pain that you're feeling right now? I may not feel like I'm Joseph in this season. I more feel like I'm the, the cupbearer right now. And I don't know, is anyone really looking out for me? I just lost everything. Fear is overcoming me, God. And who's looking out for me? Isn't it so gracious of our God how he will be like this Joseph in our lives and say, what's the problem? What's the hurt? He asks the question that needs to be asked. We see this from the beginning of Scripture to the end. To a little Genesis, because that's the book we're in. To Adam in the garden, that first question. He comes to Adam and Eve after the sin. Adam, where are you? Maybe he's coming to us and he's asking us today, where is your heart right now? Where are you? To Cain, when he's angry and he committed murder, he said, God appears to him and says, why are you angry? What's wrong, Cain? Let's have a conversation together. Please share with me. God will not force you Please tell me what's wrong. I could tell at breakfast today that something was, was off with your heart. What's wrong, my friend? Tell me. To Hagar, God appears when she's running for her life and thinks she's going to lose her child because he can't, doesn't have water to drink. The lowest place imaginable for a mom. What troubles you, Hagar? Come speak to me provides that physical sustenance, doesn't he? But he also speaks to her heart. And she comes out of that encounter and he says, she says, you are the God who sees me. You are Joseph who sees me in the place that my heart is in. Elroy, the God who sees me. That's what she names this place that God appears to her. God is your Joseph. He finds you today in this prison that maybe you're experiencing. Maybe you haven't lost everything like these two have, but you might be experiencing some loss right now in this season, some hurt that nobody in the room even knows about. And he finds you in that place. He finds you in that darkest moment. He's asking, how can I help? And you better believe that the God of the angel armies, the God of the breakthrough, has the answer for you. It may not be the answer you're looking for, but he's asking you, how can I help? And he is the one who can bring the deliverance that you desperately need. Maybe not the one you think you want, but the one you desperately need. Matthew 25. I was thinking about this in, 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 in worship today. It says, I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. 
then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you like this, hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, welcome you, naked, clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. We all need someone to tell us they're thinking about us. It's not something to repent of. God actually made that inside of you to need. Lord, we need it. I need you to visit me in my sickness. I need you to visit me when I'm naked. I need you to visit me in my prison. And I thank you that you desire to use the corporate body to release your presence. Give us a heart of compassion. Break our hearts to see the pain of our brothers next to us because we have also received comfort even in our hurting seasons, even in our darkest seasons. Let us feel your burning heart for those around us. Open up opportunities, Lord, for another to share their dream with us. Help me share my dream with another. Release courage, Lord. Release wisdom. Show us who to share these, this with. And God, would you also show us who is the cupbearer, who is the baker in my life that I can minister faithfully to. Increase my compassion. It's been far too long that I just care about my own journey. That is not Christianity. Let me feel your burning heart for those that you've placed around me. And even if others forget you, God will never forget you. Though he was forgotten by the cupbearer, God never did. Where it ends with the forgetting, 41 verse 1, and God remembered Joseph. And two years later brings it up again. He has his arms stretch out, asking you again, what's wrong, my friend? with the comfort you receive. May you be a source of comfort for one another. I invite you to stand as we will sing one more time. But I want to sort of pray one more time for an increase of activation. You say, I want to be the hands and feet of God. Ask him for an increase in your life. All of us, we need an increase. this one out. I want my heart to fall in love with my brother and sister around me. Maybe someone I never considered before, but I ask for the, the highlighting of the Holy Spirit. We can't have a savior complex. We can't reach to everyone, every person, but there's one or two that the Lord would call you in a season to reach out to to both receive blessing from and to be able to speak life into them. I ask that you would release prophetic revelation. Who are these one or two in my life you want me to invest in in this season? You want me to love in this season? You want me to speak words of life to in this season? We don't want to continue on feeling lonely in the church. I want to notice when my brother and sister are having a hard day. When they come to breakfast sad, disappointed, discouraged, and I'm asking that you would come in the midst of these conversations, Lord, that you would release a breakthrough of love in our community. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together as we close.